uh, JW a question concerning uh, uh, either nationality. Uh, if you don't want to talk about that, that's fine. You can talk about the Torah, the law, or whatever. If you have any questions about Torah, you can come here and you can talk about it right now. And then we can get back to business as usual on this channel sometime in the future. But we got Rabbi Asher back here again. Rabbi Asher is right here. I know I got Hebrew Israelites watching. And I know there are Christians watching. And I said it was going to be three versus three versus three. One of the embarrassing things about last week was, was this. Is that no disrespect to, you know, to the people that's in this room. But and nobody was prepared for, for except, except us. It was myself, Cherry Love, and I had a few other Christians in here. But the Hebrew Israelites was nowhere to be found. j Dubs had to work. He wanted to come in, but he had to work. And then on Tuesday, he told me, where were you, G-Man? I was going to come in for the show. Gary from Sharpening Your Sword came late, too, and uh, into the chat told me that he was ready. But they're here now. I don't want to hear no excuses after today. I don't want to hear no more of this hate mongering that these people are not the Jews or anything like that anymore on this channel if you're not man or woman enough to come in here and have a conversation with them. And I've been advertising this, and I know that you guys know about it. Rabbi Ashar, let me ask you a question, sir. You mm -hmm. lived in Israel for, what was it, three years or five years, I think? About, about five years. Yeah. Okay, so how long have you studied uh, to, be a, to be a rabbi? Since the day I decided to become Jewish over 23 years ago. Um, there is a big difference between just becoming a rabbi and knowing something about Judaism. If someone wants to become a rabbi, the course could take you about two years if you have a basic knowledge in Hebrew. So I think the same exists in the non-Jewish world also. If someone wants to become a pastor, it doesn't mean that he knows anything. Uh, what I know in Judaism is because I live and breathe as a Jew for the last 20-something years. And uh, I see a lot and I hear a lot and I try to give that over to my audience. Yeah, um, I think the best way to learn is learning by hearing instead of learning things the hard way. And uh, yeah, well, for me, yeah, for me, for me, this is kind of a stupid question, at least coming from for me. But for my audience, this wouldn't be that way, because I don't think a lot of them have seen your video that you made. And by the way, I'm going to be showing everybody that video before the show's over today. About the That's an old video. video. I mean, but not that I changed much, um, but my theology is evolving. Uh, but I pretty much believe the same thing I said. I think I was just defining terms. I wasn't laying out a philosophical bedrock there. Yeah. Okay, so, so let me ask you a question. And Asher, and Asher can, can testify that you know he, you know he works with. Uh, if you go to TorahJudaism.org, he he's he's brought many people to Judaism. Uh, a lot of black people, a lot of Latinos. He helps anyone. He, he's he he. If you really truly want to be part of Torah Judaism, he'll really help you. We don't discriminate. We don't discriminate, and that's my tactic when I'm discussing anything with black Hebrews, uh, because they're all about separation and. Uh, a separation not based on on keeping or not keeping God's word, but a separation based off of race. I mean, on such a primitive idea like blood. Boy, if that's not is if that's not reverse racism. I don't know what is. So uh, I'm not just appealing to the audience from that perspective uh, that that I'm the more caring one and this and that, right? But I think that I'm um reiterating the message in the Torah that people could become part of Israel. And that's my whole argument with them. See, right when you realize that someone could become Israel, that breaks your whole racist ideology. Uh, because you can't believe that all, every white man comes from from Esau if, and, and Esau is, is in some way the devil. And and adhere to the message that appears in the Torah that all of mankind is redeemable. That means if you're white, Asian, black, Middle Eastern, it doesn't matter. It's if you're obedient. Right? That's the message in the Torah. We have people, we have Ruth. I mean, Ruth, even the Bible calls her a Moabitess. Uh, but we see her being absorbed into Israel. So it seems that ultimately, ultimately, Israel is a philosophy, right? Uh, it's just a coincidence that that they happen to inhabit a piece of land called Israel. I'm not saying every Jew, right, but those that keep Torah. And there are ultimately a nation made up of belief, right? That's it. If, if you happen to have Jewish blood and you don't practice Torah Judaism, you may be an ethnic Jew, but you're not in any covenant with God, right? You've left that covenant. And I think that's a reasonable message that could appeal to anybody, you know, uh, 
blacks have been excluded from clubs, from from cities, from from schools for 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 decades. I mean, when there was slavery and the whole civil rights movement, they should understand it best that it's not godlike, and if you're a Christian, it's not Christ-like to exclude on the basis of race or on some trivial matter, right? That people should be judged, like Martin Luther King said, by the content of their character. I think that's the biblical message, you know? But these guys are just spewing the opposite message, that it's about things you can't change. It's not about effort. It's not about merit. It's not about striving to... to overcome your sinful nature, right? I mean, I don't even know why these people call themselves a religion. It, but anyways, I'm here to answer questions, yeah. Okay, cool. So let's talk about Ruth for a moment because they don't seem to get it when it comes to, you know, uh, to pe people being able to convert over to, um, to, to being an Israelite, right? Uh, Ruth was a Moabite, if I'm not mistaken, right? Uh -huh. She was a Moabite. And the, the Torah specifically says that the Israelites was, was supposed to not learn the ways of the nation that was around about them and whatnot, right? That they were supposed to be a separate people, right? But the, the, unique, the unique thing with Ruth was, was that she said that, that uh, what was her name, Naomi, I think, that her God will become her God and, and that her people will become her people. That means that they will become one. You know what I mean? That that these people would be following after the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if she does that, then she would be treated just like any of the other Jews. Now, I think I think one of the things that they would say, or they try to argue, is that the laws was different. Now, let me ask you this question: If the laws are different for for supposedly for proselytes uh, than they are for natural born Jews, does that mean that they're not Jews or Israelites? Well, if if we just determine that being an Israelite is buying into a philosophy, right? And this is what Ruth said. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. She's buying into this culture, this ideology. It has nothing to do with blood. It doesn't matter who your parents are or aren't. The, the, God's Torah itself says that there'll be one law for the native born and those who join them. Right? It's, it's not a... That we're not trying to reinvent the wheel by creating verses that we're using the same Bible they're using. So they in some way have to make their, their square ideology enter this round hole because it's just not compatible with our Bible, right? It's, it doesn't, it doesn't jive with the text there, right? Now there are a few statements that are ambiguous. I mean, if someone falls in, into what's called first stage thinking, Yes, it says that God spoke to the children of Israel because they'll make these demagogic arguments like, oh, that's what does it say? And the Lord spoke to the children of Israel. Who did he speak to? To the children of Israel. Who did he speak to? Right? This is what they usually do. This is their tactic. But then you have to show them that before it says this, if you go back to Mount Sinai, half and possibly according to the rabbis, even the bulk of who God is speaking to started off known as the mixed multitude. It says Moses brought the Hebrews and the mixed multitude outside of Egypt. So we know that on Mount Sinai, there were Hittites, there were Midianites, people from all over. And then there were a few stragglers that had pedigree going back to Abraham because we even know that the vast majority of Hebrews didn't leave it seems that that the promise God made to Abraham, not that he would bring his children out, but he would give them the opportunity to leave because if they didn't want to follow, God wasn't going to force them out. So it was ultimately God calling anyone who's willing to listen, which is really what the message is nowadays. Anyone who's willing to listen could be part of God's people, right? He used a certain group as an experiment because of what Abraham did. Out of the merit of Abraham, it's called schutavot in Hebrew, the merit of our forefathers. God gave us the opportunity to leave. and But everyone else who left alongside the Hebrews were also blessed and were indistinguishable from Israelites a few chapters later because they'll point to it again. They're like, who's God speaking to? It says, well, God's speaking to the children of Israel. Go back two chapters. It says God was speaking to the mixed multitude and the Hebrews. Ah, so now it shows that the Hebrews and the mixed multitude morphed together and became the children of Israel. That means those that were outside were absorbed 
into into what was known as Israel. You know, so we can't get stuck on first age thinking. If someone reads the Bible very quickly or picks up a cliff notes synopsis of what they think the Bible says, yes, they could come to some weird conclusion that the children of of God or the people of God are 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 Israel. And it's true, the people of God are Israel. But the question is, what is Israel? Israel is a nation ultimately made up of belief. Because if you have Jewish blood, if that even exists, that doesn't count you as in some covenant with God. Right? Uh, Say that again. Say that again. Only because you happen to have Jewish blood, that doesn't put you in some covenant with God. God is not a respecter of men alone. It's a meritocracy. As a matter of fact, we see this in the Torah many times that it says that if you do this and this, you shall be cut off from your people. Now, what does that mean? That only because you began part of this prestigious pedigree doesn't mean that you will remain in God's good graces. That means, okay, yeah, you may be a descendant of Abraham, just like a Amalek is a descendant of Abraham and Edom is a descendant of Abraham, but they didn't, didn't stay on the right path, and this is why they ultimately became the enemies of God and Israel. So it's about what you do and ultimately what you believe and how those beliefs guide your behavior, right? I mean, you're not going to want to keep the Torah unless you believe that the Torah came from God. So it's not, you know, I don't want to paint the picture in the opposite sense, because they'll say, well, uh, the black men or these specific blacks are are the original Hebrews. I'm not going to say, well, Jews are 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 Jews today are the original Hebrews. No, no. We have to meet in the middle here. It's what you do. And how you behave, that is what determines whether you're Israel or not, if you're behaving like those who stood on Mount Sinai and accepted God's commandments, if you're behaving like them, then you're Israel. All right, but behaving like them includes accepting converts, not not writing people off just because they have less or more melanin. Right, those who behave ungodlike, those are definitely not Israel. Right, but those who are welcoming, those who are merciful, just like God is merciful. Merciful, it seems that we have an obligation to emulate God, just like he's kind, we're kind, just like he's merciful, we're merciful, right? Just like he doesn't turn his back away from anyone who's willing to follow the right path, we follow in the same in the same footsteps. So, yeah, I don't think the message here is that the Jews are the people of God. No, those who keep Torah are the people of God. But the thing is, it's only really been 30 years that it's been popular and and uh, cool to call yourself an Israelite. Where were they during the Holocaust? Where were they during the hundreds of years that Jews have been suffering because of this title that they didn't easily toss away? Now that it's convenient to join a club, you know, to, to take upon for yourself, adopt in some way, steal someone else's history and say that I'm an extension of that and you are not, now they choose to be Israel, right? I, I I like to see them remain Israel when the anti-Semites come hunting for Jews. And that's all I got to say. All right. So before we get to the next question, uh, Rabbi Asher, I got uh, Gary from Sharpening Swords here and I got Jamie in here. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to confirm that this is Gary from Sharpening Swords and not a troll. Gary, is this you? Gary, you are in show. Can you, can you hear me? Is this you? J-Man, is that you, J-Man? Oh, come on already. Show up. We got a fake Gary, one? Is that you, Gary? Can I hear you, Gary? Okay, J-Man, is that you, J-Man? You got to unmute. J-Man. Now, these guys have some cool names. Sharpening swords. Wait, is that hey, a black Hebrew? Is like I can barely hear you. My, my connection's bad. Okay, is that, okay, so that's J-Man. Okay, great. So, Gary, is that you, Gary? Yeah, Sharpening Swords is a Hebrew Israelite group, but they're nice compared to the, Still. To the ones that, yeah, and, and unfortunately, Sakari is saying that they will only debate you if you bring them on his show. So, no, I'm not going to ask them to go on, um, to, to go on, uh, Everyone is welcome to join me on my live show every Monday night at 9.30, which is streamed live on YouTube and on Facebook. Just go to my YouTube channel right now, and you'll see that it's scheduled for 9.30. You guys could click on there and have any discussion. I'm not, I don't really discuss trivial matters like race, just because I don't think 
there is anything for my audience to learn from, uh, to, to, to learn. Okay, so Gary's here from Sharp New Sword. That's him. Okay. So Gary, before you say anything, let Rabbi Ashraf finish saying what he was saying. Yeah. And then I'll Shalom Aleichem. So go ahead. So the reason I came on tonight, because I typically don't discuss the topic of race, is just because my friend John asked me to swim by. And I really think it's a trivial matter. I mean, heck, we have we have the world moving left, anti-religious, and we're going to worry about race. I mean, I worry about Hashem, behavior. Right? Yeah. I worry about behavior. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, so Gary, do you have a question for Rabbi Ashar or for um, or for uh, uh, John, Gary? Gary, Gary, actually, Gary, actually, a second. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yes. Okay. Uh, Gary, you're muted. Nobody can hear a word coming out of your mouth, man. Anyways, Gary, you have a great name, like for a movement, sharpening swords. Boy, that's great. I, I, yeah. I mean, most people just. I regurgitate names over and over again, but that's like, that's for sure. That'd be a great domain name as well. I love it. All right. So, so Gary, you have a question, Gary? Gary, you have any questions? Come on, bring the heat, buddy. Bring the heat. Yeah, bring the heat, man. If you guys, if you guys, anything. You don't got to ask about nationality if you want. You can ask anything, Gary. What's your question? Gary, you, you can hear me? Yes, we hear you now. Yes. Okay. Um, no, I hear a conversation earlier. So if they have, if we just have a conversation. Sorry. We was defining what an Israelite was. Well, actually, I wasn't. Uh, Rabbi Ashra was defining. Well, he left. I don't know what happened. I think he's having a problem with this connection. J Man, are you there, J Man? Jamin, you gotta unmute. I, I heard you say my name, but I have a really bad connection. Okay. <clears throat> do you have a question that you want to ask Rabbi Ashar? If you want to call the show, you can do that instead if you want. I can put the phone number up there. As a matter of fact, let me do that now so that if anybody's got a question and they want to call in. We hear you well, by the way. I mean, Jamin, when he spoke, it was pretty clear, just in case he wanted I don't to know what happened there. connection. Put the phone number there. If you guys want to call into the show, the number is 973 378 Three seven eight zero eight four seven. If you guys want to call into the G podcast and ask a question, please understand that if you ask a question, it has to be one question, and you have to allow Rabbi to finish before you can ask your second question. All right. Okay. So that's Gary. Let me get this off of the thing. So nine seven three three seven eight zero eight four seven. Gary, is that wait a minute? Gary, is that you, Gary? Gary. Rabbi Asher, let me get to the next question that I want to ask you. Uh, Rabbi Hello, Asher, you today, connection together. I'm sorry. Say, say something again, Gary. Gary. Rabbi Asher, the next question I want to ask you. Um, how do you feel about the Hebrew Israelites, uh, their interpretation with Deuteronomy chapter 28? Do you believe that they're, that they're accurately uh, describing what, what, uh, uh, what is being said in that chapter? as well as using it as a way to determine who the Israelites are. Okay, so let's use equal scales here. Jews, Christians, Muslims, they do the exact same thing that the Hebrew Israelites do when trying to place themselves in Scripture, right? It, it The way they teach it is it may not align up perfectly, but the underlying message is that it's speaking about us. Okay, I mean, I think that if God really wanted us to go down that path, he'd make it a little clearer. He would make it... He wouldn't make it so ambiguous, you know, because by the same standards that the, that the Israelites are using to put, place themselves in Deuteronomy chapter 28, anyone could place themselves in Deuteronomy 28. It doesn't really, I mean, how, why would you use the, as a solidifying point, a verse that's talking about your exile to claim that you are who you are? Why don't you use everything else the bible speaks about like who's keeping commandments who's actually suffering in the name of god for keeping commandments not suffering for not keeping commandments which is really what deuteronomy 28 is talking about deuteronomy chapter 28 is talking about a wicked people that were once israel and will become israel again if they repent 
And how long, according to the Hebrew Israelites, did that take to happen? Well, Deuteronomy, okay. If they claim that it was the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade, right? It's it it it's been what over 250 years, if so, uh, probably around 400 years, and the bulk of African Americans are not Torah observant. I mean, blacks in America, what percentage of them identify with Black Hebrew Israelites? But less than one percent, right? But still, they're adamant that those with more melanin in their skin are God's chosen people. It it doesn't make sense. God first kicks you out for not keeping commandments, but is in some way going to unite you on the basis of race and not behavior, All right? So it, you know, to argue one verse, that itself wasn't really a prophecy in Deuteronomy chapter twenty-eight. That's part of a formula. God is God and Moses is reiterating the notion that this is what's going to happen to you. If you fail to keep God's commandments and it's going to happen over and over again. And the formula is that disobedience first brings you prophetic intervention. That Right. When you begin to steer away from God, God brings you prophets. This is why we have Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah coming to Israel, telling them, get your act together. If you don't listen to that prophetic intervention, you go into exile. And he's giving you a glimpse of what that is going to look like. It's not a specific event. This is not how we're supposed to view prophecy. Like take word for word that this is what's going to happen because first of all, you have to take into account free will. God is not going to predict that these things are going to happen exactly if you haven't sinned yet. No, like he's saying that this is what it's going to look like. So, of course, he's going to use imagery that the people he was speaking to were familiar with. Imagery of the desert, imagery of 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 over a thousand years ago, like really around three thousand years ago, right? That verse is just as applicable. That chapter is just as applicable today, with with Israelites living in the land of Israel as it was back then. It, it, it's laying down the formula, and on top of that, the formula is that if you repent, God's going to bring you back to the land of Israel. So. We shouldn't get stuck on that verse to justify who's who, right? I mean, that's part of a curse. And as a matter of fact, these supposed prophecies aren't meant to happen. Because if we have free will, they're conditional. That means if you keep Torah, this won't happen. All right? So it, let's not read the Bible like an almanac of things to come, like they have to happen. No. If we stay on the right path, they don't have to happen like this. But to assume, no, no. It appears like it's in the Bible, and I'm going, I'm going, I'm going to try to paint Black history in a way to fulfill this verse. Like this is the way the Bible was meant to be read. And that's I think nonsensical. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Gary from Sharpening Sword, let's try this again. Unmute. Do you have a question for Rabbi Asher? No, I was having bad internet. I couldn't hear anything that they spoke about. So if you guys okay. just talk, I will join in the conversation. Okay. So Rabbi Ashar and uh, and John that's in the room are considered proselytes, if I'm not mistaken. So do you have any questions for them concerning um, uh, 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 anything, really? Just uh, and, and if you, you want to quickly introduce yourself, uh, if you want. You said they're proselytes? Uh, yeah. I, converts I, to Judaism. We're converts uh, to Judaism. Converts, yes. Converts to Judaism. Do you guys accept... Um, uh, who is called um, Yeshua as your Messiah, and um, do you accept the New Testament? Are you those type or messianic? No. No, no, we're not messianic. We don't accept Yeshua or the New Testament. I personally am not anti-Yeshua. I just don't believe he's God or the Messiah. I mean, John uh, takes a different perspective. In Judaism, there's room for disagreeing. But no, we don't believe in him as our Messiah, and we don't accept the New Testament as anything divinely inspired um if i quote anything from the new testament you you accept it or you reject it uh, we would reject it just because it doesn't really apply to us it's like if we quoted something from the talmud like it wouldn't apply to you uh yeah. so i think that we should discuss what we agree on and that's the torah ultimately the torah is the foundation and if it's not in the torah then we have to agree that it was given later on and you know and it might be 
it might make you a better person. It might make you a worse person, right? There's a lot of books that only because they weren't given on Mount Sinai aren't necessarily bad, but they're not divinely inspired for sure. You, you guys keep the laws and statutes in the Torah? We try, absolutely. Okay. But Gary, that's the same thing, Gary, that uh, that the Hebrew Israelites say all the time. They say that they try to keep them to the best of their abilities. So wouldn't you accept uh, uh, Rabbi Ashar's testimony as him being a um, being a, uh, a Israelite, him, not you, him being an Israelite, uh, based on him basically repeating what the Hebrew Israelites say. They say that they, you got to keep the law, statutes, and commandments. You know what I mean? He said he does to the best of his ability, right? Wouldn't that make him a, and, and he does follow after the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, according to what uh, Judaism believes. Now, I'm a Christian. I believe something totally different about that. But um, Gary, wouldn't you accept him as being uh, an Israelite? Because he say he, uh, he keeps the Torah. No, that's not what make you an Israelite because you keep the Torah. Mm -hmm. Israelite, is, um, I think they divided them by the seeds of their father, and it's all up to your um, your bloodline, your lineage. Because um, I think the, I'm not sure what the word Israel means, uh, but I know Israel name was changed. It was changed from Jacob to Israel, right? Mm -hmm. So I think what an Israelite is what an israelite is is a person who are born from the seed of of jacob or who is called israel it's like what a christian is is a person that follows christ we call him christian um but an israelite is a person that proceed from um it's like saying a moabite i can't be a spiritual moabite mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know if you guys agree with that. Um, so I disagree that. with that, but I'm going to use the Bible to help me disagree. Now, you are oh, familiar with the notion. Wait, wait hold no. on. Rabbi, Rabbi Ashar and Gary, hold on one second. Gary, you spoke. Now, Rabbi is going to speak and you're going to listen. And then when he finishes, I'm going to let you respond, Gary. All right. So, yeah, yeah, Rabbi. so I'm going to start off by saying what I disagree with because I think that's what his last statement was. Right. I disagree with the fact or the, with the statement you made that an Israelite is only someone born from an Israelite father who could trace his lineage back to Jacob. Now in the Bible, and I mentioned earlier, but I know the connection wasn't too good, uh, but I mentioned earlier that when, it, the, it, when the Hebrews were coming out of Egypt, they didn't leave alone. They left alongside a group known as the mixed multitude in Hebrew is called Erev Rav, the mixed multitude. And this same mixed multitude stood on Mount Sinai. And it, it seems that this same mixed multitude accepted the commandments alongside the Israelites. And then they're not mentioned anymore. Some even say that Caleb, Caleb was from this mixed multitude. It said that his father was a Kezanite, I believe that's the term, which was not someone from Hebrew stock. So this is something we have to contend with. It talks about, don't abhor the Edomite because he's your brother. It, 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 there's examples that we also mentioned before, like Ruth. It seems that Jethro also sojourned alongside the Hebrews and offered sacrifices and was even part of their legal system. Uh, the, we see that the person you call Yeshua and your Messiah is also a descendant of Ruth. A woman the Bible calls a Moabitess. Where does pedigree really come into play? It seems that in terms of what actually appears in the Bible, the Bible talks about the son of the covenant. It never says what you said, that an Israelite is someone who is genetically related to Jacob, what it says is that Isaac is the son of the covenant. And who's the descendant of Isaac? Well, Israel's greatest enemy, Amalek and Edom. I, so if it's really about blood, then the Amalekites are also part of that covenant because they are descendant of the child of the covenant. The reason they were excluded from the covenant is because of behavior, because they didn't follow after the ways of God. 
the reason the mixed multitude aren't mentioned anymore is because they were absorbed into what later become, became known as the children of Israel. It says that God is speaking to the children of Israel. But a few verses before, on that mountain, there were Hebrews and non-Hebrews standing side by side, all in unison, saying, we will do and we will listen. So it seems to me that Israel is more of a philosophy. It's an ideology. We're a people united by belief to the point that our Messiah, for sure your Messiah, came from uh, Gentile stock, teaching us what? That blood is completely insignificant, and an Israelite is ultimately someone who keeps Torah. That's it. Who keeps God's instructions, God's word. And that's my response. So you're saying that the way we can identify who is who's an Israelite is basically in whether or not they're following after the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they keep the, uh, the law, statutes, and commandments. Well, that, and they have to identify it as Israel. Like if someone who happens to keep these laws just out of circumstance, they're not Israel. But if someone identifies with Israel and then alongside keeps these commandments, identifying with Israel means identifying with the God of Israel and keeping these commandments because the God of Israel said to keep them then that's what it seems uh, is what defines the existence of an Israelite, not just the color of your skin or who your father happens to be. As a matter of fact, it appears many times, we mentioned earlier, that the Torah says that even though your father may have been an Israelite or your mother from a rabbinic perspective, because we believe that it's through the mother, was an Israelite, if you break this and that command, you shall be cut off from the children of Israel. So it shows that even from that perspective, from having the from having a Jewish mother or a Jewish father, even that alone doesn't allow you to remain in the club if your behavior is not in order. So it seems that behavior trumps everything according to the Torah. All right, so Gary, you got a follow-up question, Gary, or you got a statement that you want to make and follow up with a question? No, just about um, what he said. I don't remember. It was a lot that he said. I don't remember. He's not good right now. But uh, if you said something about it's through the mother or the father that you're considered an Israelite, you have a, a Bible verse in the Torah that tells you that it's through the mother that you that you no, not at all. No, I'm saying that. Then, then you know, I guess my question would be, uh -huh. where are you getting that from? No, no. I mentioned, first of all, I said that, that according to rabbinic Judaism, this is what, what is they that? teach. No, rabbinic Judaism are the legends, tales, and legal rulings of the rabbis. I'm not trying to bring that into this conversation. I'm trying to stick to what the Bible alone says, right? Uh, now, the Bible alone doesn't say that what makes you in a covenant with God is who your father happens to be. What the Bible does say is that your father determines what line you belong to, like whether you're from the tribe of Judah, tribe of Benjamin, if you're a priest, if you're a Levite. That's what having a father, you know, uh, brings to the table, like religiously, according to the Bible, right? That's what his status does. But that does that's nothing to do with being in a covenant with God. Yeah. Right. Um, so you're saying like the father doesn't determine whether you are are like in going into the kingdom or not, but it does determine whether you're an Israelite or not. Like No, no, because if your father was a priest, let's say, and you ate um, leaven during Pesach, during Passover, it says that you shall be cut off from the people of Israel. So it shows that even though even though your father may have been an Israelite to some extent, that doesn't guarantee you remaining an Israelite because you can get kicked out of the group because of your behavior. So it's ultimately about behavior. Right. That means if you have a prestigious pedigree, if you could trace your lineage all the way back to Moses, but you don't keep God's word and your children don't keep God's word, you can't be an Israelite. But if someone from the outside wants to come in, and the example I gave was Ruth, that could make you Israel. 
Now that's giving us little hints. Honestly, I wish the Bible was a lot clearer uh, because it, it it causes, you know, the ambiguity that appears in the Torah that regarding what makes an Israelite or not has caused so many problems in the religious world. I wish it was just clear, right? So we have to take little hints here and there to really put... Uh, uh, in order to give a sound answer here, you know, yeah. so it seems that with all these little hints that it's about behavior, it's okay. not solely about blood, but I understand how you could see that it's also that blood plays a role. But I think the notion of being kicked out of the people of Israel for not keeping commandments overrides all that. I mean, that makes it as clear as day alongside the notion that someone could enter the people of Israel from outside just by wanting to join, I mean, just like Ruth did, you know. So it shows that it's it's not really ultimately about blood, right? It's about behavior and wanting to do the right thing. Right. Um, my my internet is not that great. I don't know how long I'm going to have it good for. Sure. Um, so if you can, do, I'm not saying keep your answers a little bit short, but I'm afraid I won't get through all my questions. Um, but uh, as I said, my memory is not that great. But you did say. Um, earlier that it's by the Father, and you did say that it's some, you wish the Bible was a little bit more clear because some things get confusing. And I think you're right. I think things get confusing when we interject our own beliefs in it, like when you say it's from the mother as well as the father. But you did say that you you said you there's some hints throughout the Bible. So if you can just give me a hint in the Torah, or, or anywhere in the Bible that like hints towards the mother being the determination of Brother Europe. I'm yeah. not even making that argument. I'm not saying that it's in the Bible. I mean, it's it, okay. that's not where I want to take this. I'm saying that okay. rabbinic Judaism feels this way. But let's you. just stick to what the Bible says. <laughs> now, yeah, but there right. is a verse that's brought down in the Talmud. I mean, I'll just throw this out there about Israelites getting involved with foreign women, that they will lead your children astray, right? Now, that's not enough to to build a doctrine behind it, just like it's not enough. That's like, just be, no, no, no. That's a verse in the Torah in Deuteronomy. I can't remember okay. the chapter right now that it quotes, but I'm not trying to justify anything the Talmud says, right? Uh, it was equivalent to you quoting the New Testament. I don't believe in the New Testament. You don't believe in the Talmud. I'm just saying that the Torah is not crystal clear. It seems to to point to the fact that it's about behavior, that only because you happen to belong to a specific tribe that that doesn't make you religiously Israel, that that could, that could get you to live within the borders. But if you don't keep God's law, you could get kicked out of those borders. So it shows and, that and, behavior and no is really longer, And no longer be considered an Israelite? And no longer be allowed to live in the land of Israel. I mean, who cares if... Or, uh, you're an ethic. So, uh -huh. If you're not living in the land of Israel, then I guess you won't be an Israeli, a person that lives in the land. But mm -hmm. I, my question was directed to an Israelite. I give an example. This is, I think it's the best example I can give. I was born in um, Jamaica, so I'm considered Jamaican because I know my lineage goes back further than Jamaica. We were born there in slavery. But because of where I was born, um, they consider me Jamaican, right? So an Israelite is a person that was born from one of the 12 tribes of Israel. You would agree with, you You believe in that definition or you agree with that definition that an Israelite is someone born of one of the 12 tribes of Israel? Well, not necessarily. Yes and no. Because, okay. but we know that someone could be from the outside and be absorbed into the children of Israel. But yes, that is one okay. definition. That being okay. an ethnic Israel, light, means that you're descendant of one of the 12 or 13 tribes. Right. And then that would, that would come through your your father, according to Torah, right? Right. Tribal lineage right. travels to the father. Right. So when we when we identify as Israel, we we try to identify through the father, like you just agreed to, and not through the mother. And um, and our fathers being born here in in, in bondage, um, we identify from those fathers um, as we, that we are the Israelites of the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, do you agree that these people that came 
to the Americas and the Caribbeans on the transatlantic slave trade, do you believe or agree or have done any research on whether those people were Israelites or not? I'm pretty sure that within any uh, part of the slave trade, there were Muslims, there were Hebrews. It was a mixture of different peoples. In right, some places, there were even about, Christians. I'm asking about Israelites. You mentioned... You mentioned no, no. There's no proof things. of that, right? No. Well, the only proof that we could actually describe that people could research, like research themselves is what gave birth to what's known as voodoo in Haiti and Santeria in the Spanish world, and particularly Cuba. Now, what gave birth to these religions is that this rose out of the belief system of the slaves. The French were trying to convert their slaves to Christianity, just like the Spanish were trying to convert their slaves to, to Catholicism. And what they decided, and this could be, if you look at voodoo and the history of voodoo and Santeria, this is very clear, that they were going to mix Christianity alongside their African religion known as Roots and give give birth to this, this quasi-religion, this quasi-Christian pagan religion that we know today as voodoo and Santeria. So if anything resembles what the slaves actually believed is what the practitioners of voodoo and Santeria do like during their ceremonies. And it, it includes nothing about keeping the Sabbath. It includes nothing about, you know, uh, uh, eating kosher, right? It, it really resembles what the Bushmen do in Africa even today. So uh, that's what we can prove. Now, we also know that there were many Muslims brought. That's also a fact. There were many Muslims brought in the transatlantic s slave trade, which leads okay. me to believe that there were also no. Jews in that mix. But to How say that they were specifically Jewish, I don't think we could prove that. How do you know that there was... Um... You, you say you know for a fact there were Muslims. Um, how did you? How do you know that? Well, that's been documented. There's there's Muslim pirates that would in some way capture slave ships, not the ones that they themselves uh, were shipped out, because the biggest slave traders were actually Muslims in Africa, who who were like shipping their ethnic brothers all around the world just because they found them not as human just because of what they believed, right? Uh, but in that mix, there were Muslims who got shipped out as well, prisoners um, like who were sold as slaves. I mean, even today, like Muslims still delve in the slave trade and they, uh, I would, they I, would like, I would like to look into it. So if you can All give right. me a source of how do I, you know that there were Muslims in the slave trade. Well, let me finish. Yeah, okay. you, say, you say they were not Hebrews, you there weren't Jews, but there were Muslims. How do you know that there weren't Jews and there were Muslims? Like, what source is that? So that I can look it up. I didn't know question. you were going to ask me that question. So no, I don't have a list of sources ready for you, but all no, this could be researched. I mean, That's perhaps. Okay. okay. No, no problem. What I would like to do anyway is talk Torah because you said Torah. Sure. From belief that you have, um, do you guys uh, keep all the laws that's in the Torah? Like, um, I'm not going to say like Passover, but like um, tithing and things like that. Uh, we make an attempt to keep the Torah as it appears. Now, in terms of tithing, the Torah mentions three tithes. Now, two of those tithes we can't give because we don't have a temple and we don't have a priesthood or the Levites. But there's one that some say that we still have to keep, and that's the tithe to the poor. Right? And there are many Jews who have a separate bank account and they take a portion of uh, like of their income and they'll give it personally to people they know who are poor they'll give it to some organization so we try to do that i mean the the bigger question is why do christians try to only isolate that command uh, i i have to ask a christian but i'm not one um okay but if you um you said there's three tithes if you can i don't i'm not familiar with, if you can tell me those three tithes so one tithe is for the temple uh, for the upkeep of the temple as well, and and uh, for those who take care of the temple, basically the temple and the priests, and and the Levites were the servants of the priests. Right. That is the uh, that is two of the three tithes, and the last tithe is for the 
uh, the orphan, the widow, and the stranger. Right. So they're saying that it, the idea is that we still have those among us, but we don't have the first two. For the first, yeah. um, the first type for the keep up of the temple. Mm -hmm. um, if if you can tell me in Torah where I can find, even just a book, it don't have to be. I same. mean, all all this could be Googled. Uh, I'm not making this up. But I'm, Do I have a computer I'm, in front of you? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, hold on. Okay. So why you guys watching the G Podcast, Gmail versus the Hebrew like season number nine, episode number five, and today we have uh, Rabbi Ashar here and uh, J Dub was here, and we are talking. Um, we're having Hebrew Israelites versus Christians versus uh, uh, is uh, I guess proselyte Israeli Jews. So, uh, great conversation, keeping it respectful, special okay. children, and I Rabbi Ashar to speak. Good. So the first instance is Numbers chapter 18, verse 21 and verse 24. That's the Levitical tithe. Then there's a tithe of the feast, which also has to do with the temple. And that's in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22 through 27. And then there's a tithe of the poor, which would still be applicable today. And that's Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 28 and 29. Okay. Um, yeah. So the but, one. That, sorry, mm -hmm. go ahead. Go ahead yeah. No, but all this could be researched by anyone listening. It's not. I just found it on a website right now. Yeah. The one. The first one you said was in Numbers. It's in Numbers chapter eighteen, verse twenty-one and twenty-four. Okay. Uh, and behold, I will give the children of Levi all the tithes of, in Israel, uh, for inheritance for their service. Um, even the service of the tabernacle. So that's that's not saying it's for the tabernacle, it's for the Levites because of what they do in the tabernacle. Right, correct. Right. And then the second one you mentioned was in Deuteronomy 14, I believe. 14, verse 22 through 27. And that's the tithe of what now? It's called the tithe of the feast. Okay. So it's a feast tithe. So that one is done every three years, I believe. Well, you can read it. Go ahead. Um, okay, I'll go to it. Um, that's in Deuteronomy 14, 22. Yeah, 22 through 27. Right. And you said the, 13, the third one was also in the book of Deuteronomy 14? Uh, correct. But that one starts in 28 and 29. Okay. Okay, so uh, after this, let me something real quick. We got a question in the a statement in the live uh, show that I want both Gary and... Uh, Rabbi Ashor to answer uh, when you guys are finished, but go ahead. Okay. Um, so the first one is Deuteronomy 14, 22. Um, it says, Thou shalt surely tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bring forth year by year, that thou um, and thou shalt eat. So when it says thou, it's talking about you, right? You shall eat it? Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. So this is, this is for you to eat or for the Levites or the temple? Well, you eat it at the temple. Eat the, the yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got it. Um, thou shalt um, eat before the Lord thy God in the place um, he shall choose to place his name there. Um, you say you can't do this one because you don't have a temple, right? Correct. Okay. Um, or the first one, because the first one says we well, are giving it to the Levites because right. they're working the tabernacle. Yeah. Right, right. And the tithes of your corn, of your oil, your wine, your person of your herd, of your flock, you may fear the Lord always. And if the way be too far, blah, 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 I'm going down to 25th. Um, then you shall turn it into money and bind up the money in thy hand, and you shall go to the place where the Lord chooses. So this tithe is not money, right? It's just food. Yeah, I mean, it's still a tenth. I mean, tenth it's, of it's your, yeah, yeah. Of your food or your money. Oh, with the notion of money, I mean, it's it's any type of tangible monetary, uh, anything that has monetary value. I mean, it's not necessarily cash. Right? Well, when, I, when only Abraham, I only ask that because for the Levitical tithe and not the um, Melchizedek tithe, for the Levitical tithe, he says exactly what it is. And you shall bestow that money for whatever your soul is for ox or sheep or wine or strong drink or whatsoever your soul desire and you mm -hmm. shall eat so i guess it's saying it's not money because you have to turn that money into goods right well that's what money is i mean money is goods 
but that you haven't spent yet or that you haven't purchased. That means I could have a hundred dollars in my, like in one hand and, and an hour later, like I'll have a gun in the same hand just because I bought it with that money. Now there's still a distinction between the gun and the money, but it's still anything with value. We know, but like you said, what you mentioned Melchizedek, the first tithe, it said that Abraham gave him a 10th of all he had, not necessarily all the money he had in his pocket, but of what he owned. And I'm sure it was gold and yeah. Right, but it's Levitical tithe I'm talking about. I will go back to 25, thou shalt turn it into money. And what does it mean when it says, and bind up the money in thy hand and shall go? Is I take from that is telling you, don't give anyone else the money, hold it in your own hand and you make sure you go with that money. Cause you can't travel with all that, all those goods. Right, correct. Right. For that's, and and yeah. then what catches me is the fact that in 26 it says, and thou shall bestow that money meaning use that money for whatever thy soul lusts after. So it's telling you specifically, don't give it to the temple. Don't give it to the priest. You use no, but that it's money. at the temple. Yeah. I mean, this is, right. But this is only during the three feasts. Well, and it, well, there's well, three times that every Israelite is commanded to go into the land of Israel. Finish. I'm almost finished. We know it's not at the temple where they're bestowing the money because our Messiah, that's New Testament though, he kicked mm -hmm. them out for doing exchange of money for goods in the temple. So this is outside the temple. Um, you bestow that money, whatever your soul loves after. They give you everything, ox, wine, strong, whatever you desire. And you shall eat. And it says, thou shall eat before the Lord thy God, you and your household, and the Levite that is within, that, within thy gates. Thou shalt not forsake him, for he had no parcel or inheritance with thee. And that goes back to what you showed in Numbers where he said, um, that he is the inheritance for them because they didn't get any land inheritance. So everyone had to go. All the other tribes had to take whatever the land they did receive, whatever the land produced, and then bring it to to um, Jerusalem and um, have a feast there and bring the Levites. That when it says gates within your city, you bring them with you. At the end of three years, thou shalt bring forth all the tithes of thy increase that same year and lay it up within thy gates. So if we go back up to 22, it said, lay it up every year, and at the end of three years, you bring it. And the Levite, because he had no personal inheritance with thee, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and so forth. So it's all, what I'm trying to point out to you is all one tide. It's not two or three tides. So, so where did you get that third tide for the stranger? Wait, 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 wait hold on, hold on. Well, you just broke it up into three tides. One is specifically given to the Levite and the priest, and one is for you to to enjoy during one of these three feasts while you're in the temple. And at that time, like if you happen to see a Levite in the street, don't forsake him also because he has no inheritance, right? But it's still two separate. I mean, one, you're giving over to someone else. One, you're keeping for yourself. And now the third one, you're taking care of the poor with. And that's in, in the same chapter, verse 28 and 29. Right. In the same chapter, it's just continuation. Um, of 27, which is going to 28 and 29. And he okay. says, and the Levite, because he had no partner inheritance. So he's telling you, as he said before, and the Levite said, within thy gate in 27. So when you're going to Jerusalem, you're going to bring with you people from your city that is within your gates who don't, like a Levite or a stranger or a fatherless or a widow, those people that can't take care of themselves, you bring them with you to this feast in Jerusalem. Um, so that's all under one one tide because remember, even with the first one, you would eat that that tide yourself. Mm -hmm. okay. You didn't finish reading it. Okay, let's it finish. says and the, Levite, and the because Levite because he has no portion, right, or inheritance with you, or right. the sojourner. No, the sojourner are are Gentiles Stranger. who happen to live within the borders of Israel who are not Israel. It says the fatherless and the widow. Who are within your towns? Within that your means, gate. right? Yeah. Which means that this is separate from the tie that you're bringing to Jerusalem during the feast. Here, saying that you have an obligation, a separate tie to give to those who are needy, with which could even be given in your towns. Which is why that this could be applicable today. And I pause this right there. Yeah, go ahead. I pause right there. When you said within your town. Um, and it says the fatherless and the widows that's within your town. 
what does it say? The very next thing, they shall do what? Shall come and eat and be filled. They shall come, right? That's back okay. in Jerusalem, brother. No, right. I understand that, but the obligation is still applicable even if there is no feast in Jerusalem. It seems that the first two ties are actually tied to the temple, but here is saying that even those poor in your town, you shouldn't forget them either. Okay. This is why it, it seems that if there's any tithe that's applicable nowadays, it's an obligation to take care of the poor. All right, For sure, no one can make the argument that there's any obligation to do anything in Jerusalem because there's no temple, there's no more feast nowadays that are celebrated right. uh, by Jews traveling to Israel. I got my you. point is that we still have an obligation to take care of the poor. And that's what I this verse you. is pointing to. I'm not disagreeing with that, but I'm just showing you. In Deuteronomy 14, is one tithe. It's not three tithes. When you get to 29... When it's I'm not going to go in circles, man. No, I got you, brother. I'm just going to just going to wrap it up right right now. They shall come, come where. That whole thing is talking about journey into Jerusalem. What's your point? That if you're going to keep that commandment, you keep it with the statue. That it has to go to Jerusalem, and there's not three tithes. There's one tithe. So you can't read into this that we have an obligation to give part of our tithes to the poor in our town. Even though they don't desire to come to Jerusalem, you're still giving it to them. That's all I'm saying. No, now, clearly, I this. Can't read into that. Well, okay, fine. Okay. I'd have to, like you said earlier, you just want to stick to what the book says, right? No, for sure. You know, but the book seems, from my perspective, to describe three different types. I mean, okay. let's no, move no, on to no. this because it's trivial. I mean, it's. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. So we're going to stop here from this because there doesn't seem to be a point with this. Uh, but Gary, just give me a second here, Gary. I want to give Rabbi Lewis an opportunity to uh, to ask a question. Rabbi Lewis, do me a favor, man, because I know how you are. Just just post one question towards Rabbi Asher. Let her let, let him finish, and then go to your next question. All right. So just one question, Rabbi Lewis, and then that's it. All right. Yeah. Well, shalom, Asher. Message a big fan of your work, man. Shalom, shalom. All right. Thank you. Shalom to uh, the panel. She already admitted that some blacks are Jewish, right? Would you agree with that? Sure. Really? Yeah. I mean, like African Americans when I say black. Yeah, why not? I mean, Israel, I mean, as a matter of fact, today, if you go to Israel, there's a whole town in Demona that are black Jews. There's Ethiopian Jews, there's Jews from, from India. Uh, I mean, for sure, the original Hebrews were a group of people that had color in them. Yeah. Right. Okay. How'd they get to America? Who? The Jews who were black, who, who today call African American. I don't believe that the Hebrews were specifically black, and nor do I believe that, like the Mormons teach, that the Town Lost tribes sailed from Israel and landed in America. Um, yeah, I think that blacks that were brought to this country during the transatlantic slave trade were from all different groups and faiths, including Muslim, Christian, and Jewish. Right, now, now, okay, great. Yeah, so next question. My last question, you know, will be Deuteronomy 2860, right? Where Hashem mm -hmm. said that Israel will go back into Egypt again with ships. Can you show me who, when was that fulfilled? I think that is not a prophecy. That is a formula of what will happen. And like if Israel doesn't keep the commands, right? Don't forget, we have free will. God's not going to tell us what's going to happen and how we're going to uh, go into exile even before there's a semblance of Israel as a people sinning because this statement was made to them even before they entered the land of Israel. I wouldn't want to worship a God who can foretell what I'm going to do before I'm going to do it, right? It seems that every promise in the Bible and every curse is conditional. And I don't think there's a prophecy that's going to tell us exactly what's going to happen if Israel hasn't even sinned. He's giving you an image of how exile and redemption functions. That if you fail to heed God's instructions, first he sends you prophetic intervention. That's what Deuteronomy chapter 18 points to, that he will raise up for you prophets in general. right? And if you fail to heed the instructions of these prophets to go back to Torah, God will exile you. And he'll exile you in many different ways. Don't forget, Israel didn't go to exile once. Israel was actually exiled around three times, right? I mean, the Assyrian exile was one exile that the Ten Lost Tribes didn't return from. You know, so why would that verse be be the main verse to point to the blacks being Israel when Israel has been exiled more than once? 
in many different ways not prophesied in the Torah, right? All, right. Like all the Torah says is that you'll go into exile. Yeah. Right. So, so would you be would you say that the term Egypt is figurative speech, not literally Egypt? I think it's a figure of speech, you know, but at that moment, okay, hold on one sec. It meant something to a bunch of people who just left Egypt, right? So that we have to understand that he's laying down a formula, but he's also speaking to a specific group of people that just crossed the Sea of Reeds and saw the, uh, the fire on the mountain and all of the above. So it meant something to them, and it as well means something to us. But I, let me reiterate my question. My question again was: When it says back into Egypt again with ships, is this a figure? Did did the Israelites ever go back into actual Egypt again with ships? Let me ask that. So, so historically, it appears in the book of Josephus that now I'm not saying this is a prophecy or or a fulfillment of prophecy, but it says that one way that the Romans took Hebrews or Judeans from Judah to Alexandria was by ships because it was quicker than marching them through the Sinai. This is what appears in the book of Josephus. I bring the source in my video called Black Hebrew Curses Debunked. Okay. okay. Now, I'm not using that as a proof that this fulfilled prophecy. Okay. I'm just saying that, that to say that this could only in some way be interpreted as being fulfilled by those who partook or or that were the victims of the transatlantic slave trade, that's kind of creative thinking. Right, so ask one more question. My question will be, when the, when the, according to Josephus, right, that the Romans took the Jews back on ships to Alexandria, you said, right? Mm -hmm. Can you show all 12 tribes? Was that all 12 tribes or was just the southern kingdom? Well, the 10 lost tribes by that time were long gone. Don't forget, they disappeared with Assyria, like during the conquest by Assyria, the general Sanherib, so there was no more 10 lost tribes by that time. I mean, they were gone. I mean, they were lost. So it would have been only the tribe of Levi, the tribe of, of, of priests, which are also a, a sub-tribe of Levi, of Benjamin, a sliver of Simeon, and Judah. Which right, so are, I, want, I want to say this for the Christians listening. Stop saying Durai 2868 was fulfilled by actually Egypt and Josephus because... This prophecy applies to all 12 tribes. And as Rabbi Asher Mezzi just said, all 12 tribes that don't go back to actual Egypt. It's only the southern kingdom and a mix of Simeon and perhaps one other tribe. Oh, yeah. As he was leading you in questioning. So, uh, yeah, so I, I, I guess I'll go next and then I'll let Gary go. Um, first of all, Rabbi Asher, again, thank you for coming on my YouTube channel to answer questions and everything. So uh, me and some other Christians are wondering about something that you said earlier when you were talking to uh, Rabbi Lewis. Rabbi Lewis, I'm going to mute you for a moment because I don't want you to get into this, okay? You said that you wouldn't want to. I want to make sure we can clarify this here real quick. That you wouldn't want to worship a guy who can foretell things. Could you um uh, either correct me or uh, elaborate a little bit more on what you mean by that? So I'm of the unique belief that God doesn't know the future. Now I'm not saying the Bible supports this idea, but I think that it's hard for someone to uh, to believe that God is giving us absolute free will and at the same time knows which path we're going to take before we take it. This is something that not just me, many theologians have have struggled with that. I think that God cannot do or know the illogical. That means God can't make a square circle. So I think that the idea that God is going to foretell your punishment, specifically how it's going to happen, even before you had the chance to make that wrong decision, are those many wrong decisions? Because we're talking about a nation going into exile. I think it's unbecoming of a just, good God. This is just my personal opinion, right? Because I, I teach Torah Judaism, and I and I teach a lot of inquisitive college kids, and it's hard for me uh, to teach the notion of free will, and at the same time say, it, like, tell them that God is completely omniscient. That's it. Okay, so there's two things I want to say about that. Number one, first of all, I want to uh, uh, thank you for saying that it was your opinion and you didn't say that this is theology or this is what the Bible says. That's number one. Uh, so because you said that this is your opinion, I'm not going to like be my typical self or whatever. But um, uh, what was I going to say? Is it because uh, of Epicurus and what he said about um, the problem of evil? Is that the reason why you have a problem with God for uh, knowing the future? I don't know anything about the church fathers. 
right? I mean, no, Epicurus is not a church father. Epicurus is a philosopher that said that uh, that, that that made this riddle, claiming that if God knows the future, or if God is all good and He's all powerful and He allows evil, then He's not this good all powerful God or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. It has something to do with that. And the way you made your argument, if I understand you correctly, you were trying to say that uh, because He knows that, that that if God knew the future. Uh, and then he knew all of these things that was going to happen that would that we that we would consider to be terrible. Then you couldn't follow a god like that because he knew those things were going to happen and he allowed it. Is that what you're saying? I'm not familiar with a Epicurean argument. Uh, I'm just saying that it doesn't make sense to me. I mean, it just doesn't make sense in the grand scheme of things that God demands me to behave in a certain way, and He gives me a set of laws, but He gives them to me knowing that 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 I'm going to fail and not keep them and. And I guess from a mystical perspective, end up in a hell. It it just doesn't right. make any sense. Um, can I well, say something? We're not talking about the New Testament right now. I specifically want to stick to the Old Testament uh, uh, regarding oh. that because uh, yo, know, Jews I believe in a hell also, by the way. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, it's yeah, talked okay. about. Uh, it's talked about in the song when David talked about it, right? Well, they don't believe it because it appears in the Bible. I mean, they 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 well, they believe in it because it would it crept in. Uh, from outside religions. When David talks about Sheol, I mean, he really means the grave or the pit. I don't think he was imagining an eternal place of suffering. Uh, but yeah, Jews do believe in a heaven and a hell, all right, even though the Torah is not specific. Right? We only um, got less much time in the show, so I guess I got one more question I want to ask you. And this is, hold on a minute, Gary. Um, and this is from the audience member about Genesis. How, do you, how would you interpret then uh, Genesis, uh, what is that, 13 or 15? where it, the, the prophecy about the Israelites uh, going to uh, Egypt for 400 years and that they would actually be under, um, that they would be in bondage there before he would bring them back to the mm -hmm. land. Like, like, how would you go about teaching that if you was teaching Torah? Is it the first mm -hmm. Bible of the Old Testament? How would you go about teaching that uh, to a classroom? Just so my yeah. audience can yeah, understand. For sure. for sure. I have no problem saying that I don't know. I mean, it doesn't make so much sense to me, especially by the simple fact that the numbers are off. You'd have to start counting uh, almost during the time that Abraham offered Isaac uh, almost as a sacrifice for that number to make sense. So that means the number was off also. So unless you believe that God is going to give an inaccurate number uh, of something that if that was meant to occur, then I'm sure it wouldn't be too far-fetched for you to believe that perhaps that wasn't an actual prophecy, right? I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know. There's some things in the Bible that I wish were phrased differently, but at the same time, I'm not saying that this idea that God knows or doesn't know the future is actually ingrained in the Bible. I'm saying it's just my opinion. So by the simple fact that it's just my opinion is that I myself struggle with this idea. That means I try to make sense out of all of this just so I could package it and give it over to some, to someone else in the most consistent way possible. <clears throat> and it's hard for me to remain ethically consistent when I'm discussing ethics and a free will and a good God if if I teach God in a manner that he knows what I'm going to do and and how I'm going to fail before I actually fail. It's it's just a it's more of a philosophical quandary. I'm not trying to say that the Bible teaches otherwise, you know, but just with that verse that you gave. Like you're saying that you can't wrap it around your head. Right, correct. But even that verse itself about the Israelites being slaves, the years were off. So unless you're going to acknowledge that there is maybe a printing error or that this is not exactly what what a a good God inspired, uh, I mean, someone to write, you know, but that itself is not so clear, you know? So anyways, if you wanted to really split hairs, what was given to us on Mount Sinai in terms of what do we consider the word of God? It seems that God's instructions is what was given to us on Mount Sinai. And regarding the flood, regarding all these things that came before, it seems that that was legend and it crept its way into what we call the Bible nowadays, you know? So, these portions that appear before the Torah was given to us, uh, God's will on Mount Sinai, aren't necessarily, you know, don't make or break our religion, right? Although, clearly, that we keep the Sabbath the way we do because God created the world in six days and rested in the seventh, you know. But, I mean, someone, sh they shouldn't quote Genesis chapter 15 as reverently as he's quoting a statement of God actually speaking in the book of Numbers or, De or Deuteronomy. 
I'm more like of a religious philosopher, you know, so this is why I'm presenting these ideas in the way that I'm presenting them wow. to get people to think because it's not as clear cut as many people make it seem that it is. Okay, uh, uh, and, and we're going to go to Gary real quick. It says uh, PM down, PM down up says, how can God be God if he doesn't know the future? The Torah has tons of prophecy. And again, I think you already kind of answered that because you say you take more of a philosophical approach to it. Now, I would disagree with you, uh, uh, Rabbi Asher, uh, regarding that because I believe that because God and now getting into the definition of who he is and what his essence is, he we believe that he lives outside of time and space. He doesn't live in our you know natural realm or whatever. I mean, I believe that he came in the flesh. I'm a Christian, so but I believe that he lives outside of time and space, and because he's not limited by the by by the laws of nature or whatever, it's easy yeah. for him to be able to see the beginning and the end. But that's He's Einstein's good. argument, by the way. In terms of time and space, the Torah doesn't discuss that. I'm just saying, I mean, that's not a biblical idea. I mean, I believe that as well, but that's also a personal belief. Um, it's a way to understand it in a way to wrap... Hold on one second, Gary. It's, it's, it's a way to wrap your mind around it, though. And that's all I want to say about that. Uh, if you want to have a, a, a different discussion about it, we can do it on your channel. Or we no, I don't want to debate this. I mean, I think respectable people could like disagree on this and both be right, you know, because we don't know. I mean... I and mean, there's just some things that don't make as much sense as I wish they did. All right. So I'm going to let Gary go again and ask his question. Uh, and if anybody's got a question in the audience, let me know. And then I will uh, make it aware to Rabbi Asher. Uh, Rabbi Asher has a show, guys, at 930 on his YouTube channel. It's with the name that he has there. Let me get this banner out of here so you guys can get it. It's uh, Asher. I think it's Asher Mazan. The yeah, the Asher Mesa show. The Asher Mesa show at nine thirty on my channel. Just find me on YouTube, and on that YouTube video that's going to be streaming it live, there'll be a link for you to join the Zoom. Yeah, and there's going to be a whole bunch of them there. You can ask questions, and yeah. we'll spend the time answering those questions. I've been to one of them, so you're going to get a lot if you show up. So feel free to do so. Like uh, Gary, if I show up any story, you can continue uh, ask your questions to uh, uh, Rabbi uh, Asher. And if there's a Hebrew Israel like that's in the audience, we only got about so much show left. And this and Rabbi Asher has his own show he has to prepare for. So you need to click the link and get in here and ask your questions. Get uh, Gary from Sharp any sorts. Yeah, um, Rabbi Asher. Um, you, you said, um, G-Man made a statement a while ago, and you told him it wasn't a biblical concept. It came from um, Einstein or somebody, right? When you, when you say that um, it's hard to believe in a God that would foretell what's going to happen to you, that, that's not a biblical concept. The biblical concept of God is that he does foretell and he sent his prophets to, to do that. So I know you believe in the Torah, but do you believe in the Tanakh? Do you believe in the prophets? Okay, so first, let me answer your questions in order there. Okay, now I believe that God could foretell what's going to happen to you once he already broke his covenant. And now that formula kicks in. For right. example, once Israel has sinned, now God's going to determine what's going to happen to you. He's the one who's going to make it happen, right? But right. it's different before you sin that God's going to say, oh, well, you're going to sin in 200 years, and then you're going to repent again, and then you're going to sin and repent again, and he's right. going to lay down some timeline. That's my point. No, but you're right. God does uh, foretell the future once the the judgment has been made once he judges that you're going to be exiled he determines uh where and by who you get exiled right. so can he um can he tell us um like give us the option if you sin this will happen but if you don't sin you'll be okay uh, the example i'm looking at is um the same deuteronomy 28 and 2 and all the blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee, um, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. So mm -hmm. he's telling us if, I say if we listen to him, these are going to be some blessings we get. And, we, and those are all blessings all the way down to 14. Mm -hmm. So he can do that, tell you, if you listen to me, I will reward you this way. Do, do, you, do you see him doing that? Sure. But that's, that is when it no longer is called a prophecy. That's when it's called a formula. That okay, means if formula. you do this, that'll happen. And I'm yeah, a, I'm gonna work with that. And then a formula he gives in verse 15. But if it if um, but it shall come to pass if thou will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God and observe and do all His commandments and His statutes which I command thee this day, that 
all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. So you agree that he used that formula? Yeah, for sure. But and when, the when curses aren't at, specific. Yeah. That means look at that formula that he just gave. Yeah. Um, he's giving you all the way down to 68, the, what will happen, that formula. Then he says, and the Lord shall bring you into Egypt again with ships. By the way of I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again, and there thou shalt be sold mm -hmm. unto your enemy for bondmen and bondwomen. Um, so they're going in accordance to your belief with the formula system that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So he gave you an option. If you listen and do it, this, you're going to get this good part of the formula. If you don't, here's something bad that's going to happen. You can perceive that. Oh, for sure. But in okay. terms of specifics of how it's going to happen, I think that he was giving you a general example of things. I mean, for sure, Egypt, when they heard the idea that I'm going to bring you back to Egypt, from my opinion, what they were thinking is that I'm going to bring you back to bondage. Not necessarily that I'm going to physically bring you back to the land of Egypt, and or or worse, that Egypt like really meant the the United States of America, right? I mean, it's giving you an example of punishment, right? But not right. that it has to take place. I mean, God is going to resurrect biblical Israel or Babylon. For example, there's many prophecies in the, in the Jewish Bible that talk about Babylon being destroyed, right, by God. You know, like for a specific reason. Now, Babylon didn't fall like that, but I guess that would mean that God would have to resurrect Babylon in order just to kill them again, right? No. I think it's speaking in generalities. It doesn't have to be exactly like that, but it's telling you that the bigger the point here is that keep commandments and you'll be blessed, break commandments and you'll be exiled and cursed. That's it. Okay. All right. Oh, so oh, we got my, my last question to him. Sorry, I had one last question. Uh, but uh, I'd ask you, did you did you believe in um the prophets? Not just the Torah. I know you don't believe in the um the New Testament, but do you believe in the prophets? Um Isaiah. Um, Jeremiah, those prophecies that he gave specific prophecies, prophecies to? Mm -hmm. So I believe that we have a command to listen to prophets when when God raises them up. Okay, and now there is the books of the prophets and there are prophets in general. Now there is no command for us to write the books of the prophets. I view the books of the prophets as something that's meant to be historical. It's meant to give Israel a timeline of how God exiled Israel and and how Israel acted and how God ultimately reacted, but it's not there to be used as something to build doctrine from. How was it different from the Torah? Because the Torah caps itself off regarding revelation. It says twice in the Torah, it says, don't add or take away from what appears in this book. So this is why anything, even what a prophet has to say, as a matter of fact, it says in Deuteronomy chapter 13. Now, Chapter breaks weren't instituted to much, much later on. So we could assume that Deuteronomy chapter 12 and 13, it were initially one big uh, section or one yeah. small section. Yeah. So it says in Deuteronomy chapter 12 that we're not allowed to add or take away. And then immediately it says that if a prophet tell you something that you haven't received from God or, or learned from your forefathers. I'm sorry. It doesn't come to pass. Right. Uh, no, no, no. That's another segment here regarding a prophet, like bringing you new things and uh, uh, basically new practices and leading you to new gods that these, this prophet that you should take on and stone him. But you're right. But there's a verse that talks about that if his prophecy doesn't come to pass, but that's another section saying that even a prophet can anything can add anything new. The job of the prophet is only to bring Israel back to repentance when they're falling astray because only what appears in the Torah that was given to us on Mount Sinai, that's what's binding forever. Yeah. Okay. And that was given to us by the Torah that we have, the Torah that you have, that was written by him. Well, the instructions that appear in the Torah, it seems that that revelation began in Exodus chapter 20 and it ended at the end of Deuteronomy. That means it was a continual revelation, even through the wilderness. I mean, on Mount Sinai itself, we only specifically received what people call the Ten Commandments, or I guess literally the Ten Statements. But there was a communication between God and Moses all through the wilderness, and those instructions is what we call the Torah. I mean, right. Torah means instruction. Yeah. Instruction. So when when Moses prophesied, if he wrote it, he prophesied about the coming of the Messiah. Uh, we look in the New Testament where he says, if you believe Moses, you believe on me, for he spoke of me. When he mm -hmm. says um, in Deuteronomy, he says, I would raise up a prophet 
one like on, from your brother and um, hearken unto him. So I don't believe that the Jewish Bible or the Torah speaks about a Messiah. I know the New Testament says that. And I think Deuteronomy chapter 18 is talking about the command we have to listen to prophets in general. And then right after he says that I will raise up a prophet, it says, and the prophet who doesn't speak what I command him, right? So now it goes from the singular prophet to pro prophets in, 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 in plural. And the prophet that does not do what I command him, I will hold it against him. So now this teaches us that this is not a, a, a it's not telling us that God is going to raise one prophet, but this is the only place in the Torah that God commands us to listen to prophets when he sends them to us. So if this is only talking about Jesus, then you could go ahead and toss out the book of Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, because we have no command to listen to these prophets because this verse is only talking about Jesus. I don't believe that. I believe that it's talking about prophets in general. There's no verse in the Torah that even talks about a Messiah or for sure not Jesus. Well, all right. So just real quick, guys, I can do a, do a quick announcement. If somebody could tag Dante Force and Sister E, uh, uh, Brian and the rest of the, uh, I'm sorry, and, and as well as Deboria, ISUPK, GMS, Sakari and all of them, let them know that we got a gentleman here who actually knows how to defend what he actually believes and actually has proof for the things that he says too, using scripture and is handling himself pretty well. And I like to thank Gary from Sharpening Sword again for actually being a Hebrew Israelite with some conviction to come in here and actually talk. So anyway, Gary, go ahead. Well, I, I, actually, Gary, I'm sorry, Gary, one second, because this one is I've been doing this for like an hour and 54 minutes, and, and I want to get to Veco and give Veco an opportunity to ask at least one question, and I'm going to get back to you. Veco, I think I know what I want to ask. Uh, feel free to, to talk to Rabbi Asher for the next uh, five or so minutes, because I know he has a show he has to prepare for. Now, now, now I want to let everybody know the setup here. One question, allow Rabbi Asher to answer, then you can ask another question and then allow him to answer or make a statement and ask a question. So uh, Veco and Rabbi Asher for the next five minutes or so. Let's go. Yeah, I have a simple question, uh, and it's good talking to you, uh, Rabbi Asher. I've uh, I've seen a few of your videos a few years ago, so it's good to uh, be talking to you. In well, thank you, thank you. Thank you. What, what happened? I didn't hear you. What say? videos, the ones we attack the Hebrew like we actually love those videos. He just don't know. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I, I wanted to get your take on the uh, the issue of uh, May fourteenth, nineteen forty eight. Uh, I used to be one of those uh, uh, one of the Christians that had the position that uh, that that was a fulfilled prophecy. I no longer hold that position now. Uh, I just want to know if you hold that position as well, and if so, uh, what what's your uh, biblical basis for it? Um, uh, and I'm wondering if you if you do hold to it, uh, and if uh, based off of scripture. If yours is uh, any different from what I, you know, the common arguments that I hear from um, the other side or or whatnot. So I just want to get your take on that. So I'm not a Zionist. I lived in Israel for five years. I moved there as a Zionist. I immigrated. Uh, living there, I, uh, I became very pessimistic regarding the idea that this was in any way a fulfillment of prophecy. Um, I support Israel. Like I support any democracy, but it's not a fulfillment of scripture. I don't think that Israel as it, as it exists today is a resurrection of biblical Israel, which is basically a prayer that Jews say every Sabbath. It's called uh, the Tefillah la Medina, that this is in some way the first flourishings of the Messianic age. I mean, if modern day Israel is the fulfillment of biblical prophecy, then God's going to have to apologize uh, to a lot of Israelites that he condemned for for behavior that wasn't as bad as what it and, and everyday Israeli does or practices. All right. Israel is a completely secular country. Now there are many religious Jews in Israel, but the vast majority of Jews in Israel are not religious. They're irreligious. Israel is a secular country. Now, if you're in Jerusalem, yes, the vast majority of Jews there will be religious in places like B'nai Brak, Me'asharim, uh, but Tel Aviv, basically any other city outside of the ones I just mentioned, and I guess I should also mention Sfat is a very holy place, uh, it, you're going to find that the secular Jews outnumber the religious Jews. So how can that be a fulfillment of prophecy? Um, that's it. In terms of 
1948, May 14, 1948, which is the independence of the state of Israel. This was a country that was put together by communists and atheists and was really set up to keep Jews irreligious, i.e. secular. And uh, I do have to say that Israel has become a lot more religious than how it started. And there are a lot more Jews keeping Torah. And God willing, one day, perhaps I can have a different opinion. But as it exists today, I, I, I can't see how God could use such a secular movement, which is basically communist. I mean, Israel was actually founded to be a communist country. Right? I mean, I guess we could say a socialist country. This is why all the early cities were known as kibbutzim. A kibbutz is a socialist enclave, right? Atheistical Jews uh, being united solely on the fact that they share a common pedigree. It's, it has nothing to do with believing in God. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm not a Zionist, uh, but I support Israel and I I love visiting Israel. But I just don't consider it part of God's plan uh, that uh, that. Uh, he used a bunch of secular Jews to, in some way, usher in some messianic age. Yeah. All right, that, that's pretty much it. I, I know uh, you're short on time, so uh, yeah, I'm, maybe uh, if we meet each other again, I'll ask some more questions. But Rabbi Asher, before you leave, Rabbi Asher, I want to ask you a question now. Could you uh, remind Reko about what you believe about uh, Bible prophecy, about God knowing the future, real quick? <laughs> I personally believe that God does not know the future. Um, I think that once we've sealed our fate, he knows what's going to happen to us because God is the biggest anti-Semite in the Bible. If you view anti-Semitism as someone who does bad things to Jews, well, God and the prophets had no patience for Jews who didn't keep Torah, you know, and there can't be love without standards. And uh, God chastises us like like the bad children that we behave like. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, so I'm of the personal belief that I don't think God actually knows the future. I think it conflicts with the idea that he gives us complete free will, that we have the complete free will to choose the right path and thus be rewarded by choosing that path. Um, that's That's my personal belief. Right. I wish the Torah was clearer, and there are, there are instances I think that go both ways. I think that reasonable people could 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 agree and disagree with me. Um, this is again just my opinion. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a whole other can of worms. Uh, I would yeah. love to have a discussion with you on someday. <laughs> it would have to be a philosophical discussion, just because it's just. I mean, we're discussing opinion. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. It That's doesn't fine. matter, like if there's like some verses that agree with you. I mean, it's not gonna, right? It's not gonna calm my curiosity. Of, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, that's fair enough. Fair, okay. But that yeah. being said, you know, every 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 month, the first Sunday of every month, I perform free conversions to Judaism, and you'll receive a certificate absolutely free if you're married i'll remarry you just come to south florida if there's anyone out there in south florida i'm in fort lauderdale and uh we'll convert you to judaism as long as you're willing to adopt the torah lifestyle right and 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 that's it i just wanted to put that out there and i should probably say this before the show is over because if i don't i'm going to be crucified by my own people later so <laughs> say this rabbi asher uh first of all first and foremost i have to thank you for finally coming on the YouTube channel, coming on here and actually um, defending what you believe about Judaism. That's first and foremost. Uh, number two, facing the Hebrew Israelites because I'm getting sick and tired of them saying that um, that the that the Jews don't know how to defend their beliefs. Like, it really gets irritating hearing them say that. And then we have an opportunity to have you uh, someone like you come on here and do it, and then you actually do it. I thought you did a good job, and I think a lot of other people watching this thought you did a good job when you were dealing with the Hebrew Israelites. Um, uh, uh, but I got to say this, though. Obviously, I don't agree with everything that you said. I know you don't agree with everything I believe as a Christian because you're not, you know, because you're not one yourself. So, um, no, you know, I, I, I just want to let you know sometime in the future, whether it's on your platform or mine or we can do it over email if you want. I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's up to you. I do want to talk to you about this issue about God knowing the future and his essence and his nature and who he is. 
you know, and try to be as respectful about it as humanly possible uh, while we do it. You know, I, as far as I know, I don't have a bunch of people on YouTube claiming to be the biblical Jews. You know, I'm sorry, not the biblical Jews. I don't have people who I consider to be the real Jews attacking me all the time. So I'm going to try to be a lot more chatterable and more, a lot more nicer regarding a conversation like that. So I would love to have a one on one talk about that uh, all right. in all private right. channel, your platform, whatever. So uh, uh, thank you again for coming on here. Is there anything that you like to say to the to the audience or to the Hebrew Israelites? Go would to you, my website. Are you website? Editing? TorahJudaism.com. Before I forget to plug in my website, TorahJudaism.com. There I have all my debates and discussions. Do you have a question? Uh, every Monday night, as a matter of fact, in one hour, 9.30, that we have a, a show. Just go on, on my YouTube channel. and like, If you open the live stream, there'll be a link to the Zoom, and you guys are welcome to join every Monday night at 9.30. Uh, and then there's other people there you could speak to. There's many Jews there, you know, Jews from birth, uh, you know, European Jews, Farty Jews. There's also some I've black Jews. He's right. I've been there. Yeah. But you're all welcome. And, and uh, you know, that we don't attack anyone. The goal here is to learn. Right? Like we're here to learn. That we're not going to, like, change anyone's mind by by yelling any like at anyone on, on YouTube. Right? That we're just here to bounce ideas from each other. We're all, you know... I mean, clearly this show and my show are are for PhDs in religion. I mean, like not actually having a degree, uh, but this is big boy religion. You know, the, on this show tonight, like we've been discussing serious topics that we could basically knock any preacher off his, his heels. You know, uh, it's this is heavyweight talk, right? That most most people don't don't discuss the Bible like this. You know, most people. Uh, all they discuss is only about God's love and how much, you know, what could separate us from the love of God. And and these are all nice topics, you know, but there has to be a handful of people on this planet discussing serious concerns, right? Uh, uh, macro issues. And this is why I appreciate what G-Man does. And, uh, you know, that you keep it sharp, you keep it fresh. And that what we're doing, we're setting up a bedrock for our children, you know, who are going to pick up where we left off. Right? I mean, can you imagine anyone having a discussion like this 40 years ago? I mean, nonsense. If you just listen to the cassettes of, of, of biblical discussions in the 60s, they're like primitive, right? I mean, compared to just, you know, any YouTuber nowadays who, who who's, uh, uh, knows the Bible probably better than anyone did 50 years ago. It's amazing how, how far we've gone. And it's not just in the Jewish world, in the Christian world also, right? We've come a long way, and I think that, that we should be proud at our progress, right? And that's it. All right. So, Rabbi Ash, I'd like to thank you again for coming on here. You're free, feel, feel free to come on here anytime you want, whenever I have the Hebrew Israelites on here, if you want to have a discussion with them. Uh, Gary is a really good one to have a discussion with, and the people that he hangs around, the Sharpening Swords members, I'll give them credit. They don't raise their voice and go crazy on here or whatever. They're really good to talk to. Uh, there's a couple of other people like Jacob and a couple of other people I got, I got on here. So if I see them, you don't mind, I'll shoot you an email. And if you're not doing anything, I would love to have you come on here and talk with them as well. Okay, cool. All right, all right. Thank you. And then next time you come on here, sir, we need to have a chat about your salvation, all right? So all right. <laughs> pray for me. Pray for me. I love people, you know. Come I mean, to Jesus. I know you don't like that word, but, you know, we got to get pray you to come me. to Jesus, okay? I, <laughs> I love people trying to save me, you know. I love it. All it right, doesn't cool. bother me. It doesn't offend me. Yeah. All right. Cool. So, so, uh, if you want to go, you can, Rabbi Asher. I'm just going to address the audience right. real quick. Right. Gary, you guys, appreciate you coming. So anyway, guys, um, I hope you guys enjoyed the show today. Veckel wants to know, am I going to be shutting things down? Veckel, you there, Veck? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yep. Yeah, I was just wondering, was, was that the, uh, is that the end of the uh, live stream, or uh, are you I, opening it? I, I, it's around two hours. We're still alive, but I'm oh. just going to be do the plugs and all of that stuff. Oh, yeah. What time did wow. you start, right? So, if you want to stick around, we can talk afterward. Uh, Gary, let me ask you something, Gary. Do you believe that Rabbi Asher was respectful? Yeah, I think everybody was respectful, man. All right, cool. And I really do mean what I say about you, Gary. Like I said, ain't that many of the Hebrew Ridgelites on here that know how to have a respectful conversation. You're one of them. Oh, okay. I appreciate it. And you disagree on some things regarding the tithing and some of the other things that you were talking about. And you was you were chatterable about it. I still think you're wrong about being a he, you know, with the whole teachings and everything and whatnot. But at the same time, at least you was respectful about it. You know what I mean? 
Mm. Yeah. Right. If they 